Last week you had the joy of listening to Wendy preach, and, and I heard that you didn't want me back, and that's okay. You know, I'm, I'm leaving again next week, and she's going to preach, so you can come right back and hear her preach again. Um, but she got to preach on words not spoken. You know, we're talking about regrets, the things that we regret at, at end of life. And, and I've actually sat there with people at end of life and, and heard them share their story, heard them share their regrets, had them ask for forgiveness. Maybe you've thought that through. Maybe you've imagined yourself at, at a place where you're actually able to sit down with people of, in your life and share with them the things that you wish you could have shared. You watched a video last week, and if you, if you weren't here to see that video, you can check it out online or on our Facebook page. Um, it's a video about the things that we regret. And most often, they're the things that, are the things that we don't do or don't say. Wendy talked about missing out on saying words like, I love you, I forgive you, I'm sorry, telling your story, proclaiming the good news. Regrets are those things that, that we wish we had done. Each of you last week, you could probably imagine things that you wish you had said to someone. Things that you wish you'd gone out of your way to make sure that they knew. And it's not just that they didn't know it, because they knew. But the words add validity. The words add depth. Today we're going to talk about chances not taken. You know, we've actually kind of included some of this in, in previous sermons, chances not taken. Actually, one of the top five things that people are afraid of, fear of failure. Do you remember this? Fear of failure is one of the top five fears. So you know what that actually causes people to do? It's like, you know what, I'm just not going to try anything. I'm just not going to do that. I'm not going to take the risk to try something new because if I do, I might fail. If I try that, I could fall down. I could slip up. I could look like a fool. So most people prefer to stay in their comfort zone or in that status quo. This is just the way life is. You guys familiar with this? Yeah, don't make any changes. Don't make any sudden moves. It's coasting. I, I like that. I don't think that that's exactly what God had desired for us. Did you know ancient Greece, they used to have, um, in their law system, I, I looked this up and I thought, this is pretty interesting. I think it would change the way that laws were put in place if we had this. It's, it's actually that for statesmen who are going to pass new laws, they sit in public and get people to vote on them. But the problem is, when you're suggesting or recommending a new law, you sit on a platform with a rope around your neck. If the law passes and is deemed a good law, the rope is removed. If it doesn't pass and it's deemed not appropriate, you know what happens to the platform? Boy, can you just imagine the political realm in that case? There would not be so um, many laws suggested without making sure that you had support. It might promote silence and shorter political meetings. You know, I thought about that. I thought, you know, church can be the same kind of treacherous ground, can't it? To suggest something new as a pastor or a leader, it can be dangerous, am I right? Have you been there? Have you, have you seen what it takes to make change in a church? No, maybe, maybe we shouldn't suggest change because you might just the platform might give way. But can you imagine what would happen in a church or in your home or in a business if you had to wait until there was absolute consensus and, and nobody ever suggested anything new because you're afraid of what's going to happen? Hmm. 
Jesus didn't leave the church in the hands of many. Jesus left the church in the hands of a few. And, and I want you to hear me very clearly today. I'm talking to, to each of you. You're here. You're part of the church. You are a part of the kingdom of God. You are disciples. Jesus left the church in the hands of his disciples. And specifically in this passage, we encounter this, this time of Pentecost where the Holy Spirit descends, and fills the house, and they go out and they preach. They do something radical. And Peter goes out, stands. Now, just imagine, think for just a minute, who is this Peter guy? Peter's often thought of as as rash and quick-tempered, radical, strong-willed, opinionated, and he was willing to take chances. In fact, he was out there so far, so often, Jesus told him, get behind me, Satan. And yet, Peter, this, this, Peter, Jesus put the hands of the church, put, put the church in the hands of Peter. Someone willing to take risks, to try new things. Peter, who, by the way, let's just look back a little bit. Peter, who was the only one of the 12 disciples who was willing to get out of the boat and actually walk on water to get to Jesus. Now, anybody want to say that that would be taking a chance? If any of you tried to walk on water, you know, that's taking a little bit of a risk. Peter is this guy who's not afraid to take a risk, not afraid to take a chance He gets out of the boat and starts walking on water to Jesus. And and of course, we know the story. We know that the the wind blows. It distracts him. He takes his eyes off of Jesus and starts to go down. And you think about that. How many of us, we try something new. We get all enthused and we jump out of the boat. We try that new thing. And then all of a sudden, we start to go down. And we experience going down in such a way that all of a sudden, we're like, I'm I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to try something new again. I'm never going to take that risk because I don't want to fail. But I want to point something out to you. Do do you realize Peter was the only one? The rest of them stayed in the boat. None of them had even the remote idea what it felt like to walk on water. None of the rest of them even understood what one, two, three, five steps to walk on water would have felt like because they weren't willing or able to take that chance. Wouldn't you rather be the one who took the risk? Wouldn't you rather be the one that even for that moment in your life felt fully empowered by God, fully filled with the Spirit, and truly focused on God? I can imagine... Years later, all of the rest of the disciples sitting around and talking and, or even talking to their family and thinking to themselves, I, I just wish I'd tried that. I, I wish I'd gotten out of the boat just a little bit. I, I might have sunk, but I mean, Jesus still caught him. I wish I'd taken that chance. This series is about taking that chance with Jesus. Trusting when he asks you to step out of the boat that, that even if you fall, he's going to be there to catch you. And along the way, you're going to have steps that nobody else has ever experienced in your life. What does that look like? This story of Pentecost, we're so familiar with the Holy Spirit and, and, and the fire, the tongues of fire on people's heads. We're so ex- used to hearing about how they went out and they preached and, and 3,000 people came to faith that day. It's the birthday of the church, right? This is the church's birthday in case you didn't know that. But do we ever think about the setting? Do you ever really think about the risk that was being taken? I mean, understand, Jesus was just crucified. The disciples had scattered. They were afraid. Now, yes, Jesus was there and and gathered them together a little bit, but they were still essentially in hiding. The turmoil of the time, it was the setting of society was hostile to them. It was dangerous. The Pharisees were angry. Rome was in charge. The disciples had been warned. So even when they're waiting in the upper room, they're kind of still in hiding. 
You know, they didn't gather there just ready to, ready to burst forth. We, they were probably still hiding. So the Holy Spirit shows up, and now all of a sudden, they take this risk, and, and they, people hear the noise, the commotion, and they go out, they start preaching. Peter, Peter stands up and proclaims the good news to the whole crowd. And that is taking a chance, by the way. That's taking the risk that, hey, I'm going to be crucified along with Jesus. I just saw what happened to Jesus and, and taking the risk that that could happen to me. But can you imagine, Peter, if he hadn't done that and years later looked back and said, what would have happened if? Or maybe we should be the ones asking, what would have happened if the church never had a birthday? What would have happened if the the disciples hadn't gone out and proclaimed the good news that the, whole, the Holy Spirit had just filled them. Not only was it treacherous community at the time, people were already mocking them. How many of you at work or at home encounter a situation where people are picking on you, they're mocking you, they're saying, oh, you're just drunk. You're being stupid right now. I, you don't even know what you're talking about. That's what they were saying already. There were some people saying, wow, this is great. And other people saying, you guys are drunk and out of your minds. And yet Peter and the disciples still had the courage, even when they were being mocked, to take the chance to proclaim the good news. What if he hadn't? You know, as I thought about this topic, you realize taking a chance doesn't just change us. It doesn't just change what's going on in our life and, and give us the opportunity to take steps where nobody else ever has, but it also changes people around us. Every chance that you take that is a, a step of faith, it impacts people powerfully. Being willing to and having the courage to do so makes a difference. Truth is, I don't think, I don't think Peter had any idea what was going to happen because of Pentecost. He'd seen Jesus preach to, many, to big crowds many, many, many times. He did not know that this would become known as the birthday of the church. You know, what's interesting is often we can't see the future. Okay, can anybody ever see the future? <laughs> I can't. We can't predict what's going to happen because of something. Often, I know groups that will say, well, I need to plan enough so I know exactly how this is going to turn out before I do anything. I don't think that that's always the way God works either. God requires us to step out in faith and then he makes something beautiful happen. Did you know, actually, this is, this is directly from Steve Jobs. He said, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You should have to trust something, your gut, destiny, life, karma. He says whatever, but I'm going to add God. This approach, he says, never let me down, and it has made all the difference in my life. Wow. Think about that, those words of wisdom from Steve Jobs. This is someone who was willing to take risks and along the way willing to admit the faults, the failures. If you do a little bit of research about Apple, they had hundreds of millions of dollars worth of loss and failures Computers that didn't sell and other things that didn't go and things they had to toss out of their research and development. It's not that they didn't have any failures along the way. They had many, many, many failures. But because they kept trying, kept taking the risk and taking the chances, they're known as one of, maybe the top, computer. You know... Michael Jordan says this too. He says, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career, lost more than 300 games, 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot, and I've missed. I failed over and over again in my life. 
and that is why I succeed. You know, I sometimes think our fear of failure prevents us from taking chances. Our fear of failure prevents us from stepping out in faith. And yet, Michael Jordan says that it's his failure that makes him successful because he keeps on going. Taking a chance, I promise you, taking a chance will mean failure. You will not succeed 100% of the time. But taking chances, even though it means failure occasionally, should not prevent us from taking that chance. Peter goes on to be, become the rock of the church. And in Acts chapter 10, Peter's called once again to do something that he wasn't quite comfortable doing. This is the story of Cornelius and the soldier, and the story of Peter is just you know, making, making lunch. And all of a sudden he has this, he goes into this trance-like state or this dream-like state, and all of a sudden he feels like God is telling him, this food is clean. And you know, Jews have this perspective of clean and unclean, what is holy and what is unholy, and all of these different things. And all of a sudden he has this, this vision that what God has made clean, Peter shouldn't see as unclean. Even though for all of his life, all of his teaching, all of his understanding of his Jewish faith, Peter had believed that these things were unclean. And so in, this, in Acts chapter 10, this, these people show up right after he has this, this vision, and they say, we want you to come with us. And Peter takes a chance. He takes the risk, and he gets out, and he goes with them the next day, and then he visits and finds out that these are Gentiles. They would have been considered unclean. But he begins preaching, and he sees the Holy Spirit fill them. And then they're baptized. Now, I want you to understand, this would have been a risk too. A leader of the church, this new church, brand new church. And all of a sudden, he's going out to people who are not Jews. And he's baptizing them. Can you imagine what other leaders would think? What some of the other disciples would have thought? Can you just imagine coming back and saying, by the way, guys, I just need to let you know I, I, I did something that we're not supposed to do. I, I, you know, I invited Jew, Gentiles into the church by baptizing them in Jesus' name. That's taking a risk. That's like sitting on the platform with a rope around your neck. What does it mean to take a chance? And yet, can you imagine what would have happened if Peter had not been obedient to what God had told him to do? Peter's chance changed the lives of Cornelius and his family. But I'll tell you what, that thing that happened in Acts chapter 10 changed the dynamic of the church. Because before then, even the 3,000 people that came to the church on Pentecost, they were Jews. All of a sudden now the church is open. All of a sudden their mindset is changed. And they're inviting in people that are completely different. What would have happened if he hadn't taken the chance? You know, in my um, newsletter article this month, some of you read that, I mentioned about um, hosting someone in my house that's a complete stranger. Anybody shake your head that you read that? I didn't think so. Just checking. <laughs> Some are good. What kind of risk is that today? You know, um, or to take a hitchhiker. I, I tell the story of how that really happened. I'm looking to do this sabbatical next year, and, and um, I was doing some research, and I found this thing called couchsurfing.com. Did you know you can open your house up and have complete strangers ask to stay in your house with you? because they're moving, they're traveling through the area. I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. What would Jesus tell me? And then the real question is, what would my wife tell me? 
That's another whole topic. (laughs) But what does it look like to have the kind of hospitality that Jesus would tell us to have? And then I got to thinking, part of this would be, what, what would it look like to stay in someone else's house? Would it take more courage to, to be the host, or would it be more, take more courage to be the guest? So actually, after I'd signed, this, signed up and just checking things out, see what this would be like, even as part of a sabbatical, um, I get this notification, somebody asking to stay at my house. By the way, I hadn't told my wife that I'd signed up for this yet which was even more fun. <laughs> but this guy's from Ming, Ming Li, and he's from China. Okay, that's another whole thing. Now we've got cultural issues. What's that look like? Lord, should I open my doors or not? Should I take the chance, take the risk, welcome the stranger or not? What does it look like? I did. We had him into the house, and I cooked a meal for him. We sat around the table and ate and visited, and, and I learned all kinds of things that, that I wouldn't have learned otherwise. I learned about his home and his community and uh, some of the situation of how they you know, would even sleep and how their, their fireplace was set up in their home. He thought my house was huge. He explained to me that we should be using the, the dandelion um, leaves because they're good and healthy. He was really surprised that we had wild rabbits in the yard because... They wouldn't have those. They would be trapped already, which I thought that was a great idea. I learned all kinds of things, and we we were able to share. And I found out he's actually um, traveling around and supervising Mandarin language teachers. He was here for Drake. And he continues to travel and, and supervise, and he's away from his family all year and gets to go back one for one time a year. And he said, the reason I joined Couchsurfing was because I was tired of staying in hotels and being lonely. Never having any friends. Never feeling like I had family or anybody there for me. He said, I joined Couchsurfing because I I just needed to feel like I fit somewhere. (laughs) I said, thank you, God, that I get an opportunity to show your love and your grace. The real neat part of the way that developed was he also asked, us, what does a pastor do? I don't even know what, what's a pastor. He didn't know what a pastor was. Didn't have any understanding of faith or church or otherwise from his community that he came from. And he was the one who asked questions because I had posted that that's who, who I was and what I did. And so he just opened up this whole dialogue of what does it mean to be a pastor? And I'm thinking to myself, okay, God, maybe you opened up this door for a couple of reasons. When we take a chance, I didn't know where those dots were going to lead. I didn't know what kind of doors that was going to open or the opportunity to even share my faith was going to be present. But sometimes just taking that chance will do something amazing. I couldn't see the dots forward, but now that I got through and I'm looking back, I'm thinking, I see the dots What does it look like to take that kind of chance? Mark Twain actually says, 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things that you didn't do than by the ones that you did do. So throw off the bow lines, bow lines. Sail away from safe harbor. Catch the trade winds in your sails. Explore, dream, and discover. This new church is a risk. It's taking a chance. When I was called to come here and, and start doing this, and there was excitement, but there was fear. Fear of failure, fear of, of every other thing that could get in the way. Did you know that only 68% of churches, new church starts, survive four years? By the way, we're, we're past that. Did you know that it's easier for a new church to grow and to start new ministries, to make an impact than a church that's been there for a long time. I want you to each, each of you realize it wasn't just me that took a risk, it wasn't just my family that took a risk as a part of this, but each one of you, New Hope as a church, taking us in that way, the core team, every person who serves here, 
every offering that you give, it's taking a chance, saying, God, use this, and we don't know what the dots are going to look like. We don't know where you're going to lead us, but we're having faith that you have called us to this. It's like stepping out on that water like Peter did. It's like taking a chance. It's taking a chance to show up here or to go to a new small group, to attend a worship in a school, to go to on a mission trip like Honduras or coming up to Detroit to help out. Even the connection with Hopkins Grove. It's all a chance. It's all being faithful to something that we can't see the full picture of. Chance is not taken. Will you be willing to be Peter? Can you step out of the boat? What's God calling you to that's uncomfortable or that you're scared might mean failure? What I'm going to tell you tonight is if you have something stirring in your spirit, if God is challenging you on something, and the only reason you're not moving on it is because you're afraid, you need to step out of the boat. You need to take that first step, not knowing where it's going to lead you, but knowing that when you get there, you can look back and say, yes. I challenge you to know what it feels like to walk on the water, to try something new, to meet a stranger, to share your faith, to invite someone into your life, take a risk to say the words that you maybe have feared saying. Open your door to the stranger. Immerse yourself in different cultures and open your mind that God might show you a new horizon and challenge you to take a new step. The church wouldn't be here today if thousands and thousands of people along, along the way hadn't taken a chance. Would you pray with me?